Thank you, uh, Ladson. It's uh, definitely an honor and a pleasure to be here. And um, over the years, I've kind of learned as a demographer that in some ways the more basic and simpler the presentation, the fewer numbers, the better it is. So that's how I'm going to do it today um, in my 10 minutes. Um, basically, the demographic trends that we're going to experience in the future are going to be a challenge for the next century, but we shouldn't look at it as a negative. It's a positive. It came from the great success we had in the last century. So basically, we controlled mortality, and that resulted in people deciding to control fertility and have fewer children. When you do that, the population ages. There's no other way. It has to happen. The aging of the aged that is happening now is because we have reduced mortality for the oldest members of the population. That is a plus. So we should think of this as a plus, but it's a new world, a world that we have to adjust to. So if we look at the future, what we see is there are going to be more older people. There is no question about this. Demography is facts. There's really very little way to change this. And there are going to be more 85 plus population. When you're talking about caregiving, you tend to be most interested in terms of numbers in the oldest population. This is what is going to happen. This is going to happen for every subgroup of our population. I'm not going to show you a lot of numbers about different ethnic or racial groups. What is happening is the same for everybody in general. Timing could be a little different. The extent of it could be a little different. But the issues are the same. So what's happening? The old age population is growing. There's been a, uh, a, a decrease in the growth rate of the working age population, the population that you think of as one that supports the older population. We think we've already been aging, but we have not seen anything yet <laughs> because what we, the real issue is when the baby boomers start hitting 85. So real aging, in a sense, is in front of us, not behind us. Yes, we've been aging for a century, but real se serious aging is in front of us. Now, why do we care about this? Because if characteristics are strongly age-related, it makes a, has a very strong impact on the demands that that population can make on the rest of the population. Typically, we show you a population pyramid, which is the structure of the population in total. But I've just made this pyramid looking at the age sex-specific proportions of people who are disabled, who would be the people who would be in need of some kind of care. And that is an upside down pyramid because the most people who need care are the oldest people. So really, it's the combination of the change in the age structure and the intensity of the demand for care in the oldest population that is setting the stage. This isn't going to change. Marie may talk to you about variations in the disability trends, but there it's going to be this way. How big it is can vary with different things that will happen, but this will happen. As I said, that what's going to happen is going to happen in the same way among all subgroups of our population, but we are a population that has changed ethnically in the past and racially, and that will be true in the future. So we know that more of the older population, more of the population that requires caregiving will be members of the growing uh, race and ethnic groups. This is an in shows an increase in the proportion of people in the frail older population who are African American, a relatively small increase over time, and a dramatic increase in the proportion Hispanic origin in the population. So there are that composition will change as the composition of the population changes, and we need to be mindful of that, perhaps, in policies. But it, the same thing is going to happen across populations. Now, 
what about social trends? And I decided to illustrate the social trends with the personal example rather than a uh, Census Bureau example. I have a picture of my family of origin up there. My parents came, are in the generation that has aged, and those are my brothers and sisters. I'm one of those four girls, and there are three boys. And at the bottom is my family, which is a very typical baby boomer family. All seven of us have families that look like that. But that's what families look like now. And in some ways, the change within families is greater than the change almost within populations. It reflects it, but it's very dramatic. So the people who have been aging now, my parents went through that. They had four girls to choose from, probably first choice, three boys. Um, there was someone relatively close to do what had to be done in the period uh, when they needed long-term care. I, being a gerontology person, am looking to the future, and I have two, and one lives far away. I've got one close. That's great, because this is an issue of social and economic conditions, actually. The, the wealthier you are, the more educated you are, the more likely your children are the same, the more likely they do live across the country for, from you and further away from you, the more likely your sibs do the same things. So this is one of those cases where the people who might suffer from lack of people near them are the upside down people, the people who are better off rather than the people who are worse off in, in economically. And this is changing. Everybody's getting somewhat more educated. More educated women uh, don't want to take care of their parents as much. There are fewer people who will have spouses. Now, you don't need a spouse to have a caregiver, but typically people who have a spouse have someone there who can do something. And the percent of frail older persons who are divorced or never married is going to increase. The same generation that changed patterns of divorce when they were younger are going to live to be older now, and they are going to have had different histories. And they're going to come up with fewer children, fewer spouses. We all know that people who don't have those people can live their lives and build their li into their lives people who are potential caregivers, but they have to do that in some ways on purpose almost. It's not something that might happen as naturally as if someone is already in the household or has been in the household. So these are changes that we know are pretty much on the horizon. And as I said, more women will be working. They're not available to provide uh, family care. More members of the family will live further apart. We know this will happen. It is going on right now. And it, so it is something we have to adjust to. There will be more demand and fewer people to offer family caregiving. But and my major point to you, in, and I, as a demographer, I want to be clear that I do not think demography is the be all and end all. It is not our destiny. It sets a context within which we must work. And we know the limits of that context, but really, policy is what is more important than demography. Policy must adjust to the demography and basically understand the demography and help the circumstance, uh, help caregivers so they can do probably what they really want to do. So I have an example up there of a case where policy really influenced what we found in terms of caregiving. One of the things we're able to do now is look at multiple countries where we see national policies as varying across countries that allows us somewhat a national laboratory. We looked at caregiving in Spain, England, and the US. Spain is extraordinarily familial. People live with a child. Um, we thought they would be the ones that would be most involved in family caregiving. And the truth was, when we found, looked at the results, Spain was not as involved in family caregiving as either England or the US where resources for family caregiving are much less. In fact, the people who gave the most family caregiving to older disabled people were Americans. And I don't think it's because Americans are better or good. <laughs> I think it's because caregiving is not paid for. And there's no other way to get it but to do it as a family. And, and what we observed in Spain was that people who you would have thought would have been natural 
natural caregivers withdrew from the caregiving role when the state was available. So even spouses didn't care for spouses and children outside the home did not care for parents and children within the home began to take on formal care very early. So I think it's somewhat of a lesson. We've always thought that you know, there are many people out there to take up resources that would be available for caregiving. But I think we have to design our policies to basically make it so that people who want to care give, which I think Americans do, can do it, in a way, even though they may live further from their parents, they, uh, they may uh, be working, we have to use new technological approaches, new policy approaches to basically assist people to do what they want given the demography of the situation. Thank you.